This video is brought to you by MUBI, an online cinema streaming hands-picked exceptional films from around the globe. Get one month free at MUBI.com slash like stories of old. Once there was an explosion, a bang which gave birth to time and space. In Hideo Kojima's latest game, we are introduced to our world during a pivotal moment in its evolution. A moment on par with the great cosmic events. The Death Stranding. The Death Stranding refers to a cataclysmic event that entangled our world with the beach. A dimension existing as a sort of limbo somewhere between life and death. Normally, the souls of the deceased would pass the beach on their way to the afterlife. But now, they instead become stranded in the world of the living. Referred to as beached things, or BTs, these lost souls consist of antimatter, which, when brought into contact with living matter, results in their mutual annihilation by triggering what is called a void out. Once there was an explosion, a bang which set a planet spinning in that space. The event also introduced Chiralium, a mysterious form of matter that was transported from the beach to our world and manifested itself there in crystallized form. Like the beach, Chiralium does not experience time, and because it exists primarily in the atmosphere of our planet, the presence of this otherworldly matter causes timefall a form of rain that steals away time from everything it touches, and often brings with it the BTs. Once there was an explosion, a bang which gave rise to life as we know it. As such, the Death Stranding was a devastating event. The initial explosions, the subsequent void outs, and the destructive effects of timefall put humanity on the brink of ruin. Survivors retreated into isolated settlements and what became known as not cities. And then came the next explosion. An explosion that will be our last. However, a shimmer of hope remains as people found a way to utilize Chiralium for technological advancements. Most importantly, it is the foundation for the chiral network, which can be seen as an evolved version of the internet, capable of linking people together unlike anything that came before. It is essentially a promise, a chance to rebuild the isolated cities back into a united nation, and save humanity from extinction. When breaking down the premise of Death Stranding, in which a divided nation must be reunited again, we immediately see the obvious parallels with Kojima's observations about the current state of the world. Trump has made a wall, and 
Those who have played a Hideo Kojima game before know he isn't too subtle when it comes to metaphors and symbolism. In Death Stranding 2 a lot of the themes are directly revealed through the language and imagery of the game's world. Bridges, borders, strands and knots all reveal the central role of connection. Handcuffs are used to comment on the freedom of the individual in a wider social system. These aren't handcuffs. They're cutting edge devices that keep us all connected. Character names almost always reveal a defining quality of who they are, which, in case you missed it, is often explained by the characters themselves. Call me Dead Man. I'm well acquainted with the dead. I'm fragile. But I'm not that fragile. And after a while they started calling me Hartman. And if they're hiding something, they are most likely wearing a mask. But what about the Death Stranding itself? What does this mysterious event signify? What does it mean on a metaphorical level? While I don't believe that deconstructing every little detail in this story will lead to a cohesive understanding of it, as Kojima does tend to make his narratives needlessly complicated. In general terms, the most fascinating thing about the Death Stranding as an event, at least to me, is that it seems to take abstract social realities and subjective experiences and turns them into tangible physical phenomena. The void outs triggered by dead bodies remind us that when we die, we destroy more than just ourselves. The chiral network makes explicit the intangible social dimension created by the internet and shows us that the implications of its existence are about more than wires and wavelengths more than data and information. Time foam makes time truly relative, not just in the context of the natural sciences, but also in the way we experience it in our minds, which can warp time just as matter and energy do, making an instant feel like eternity, and vice versa. The bridge baby that is carried around in an artificial womb to spot nearby BTs forms a link between the living and the dead, and in doing so, captures the strange space between existence and non-existence. And our souls, the essence of our beings, are given shape by beaches, as are our collective memories and our traumas. While these metaphorical meanings certainly are interesting in themselves, What's more important is how they serve the larger story. Knowing we have all these allusions to time, death and connection, what does Kojima do with them? How does it all come together? You play as Sam Porter Bridges, who is essentially a post-apocalyptic delivery man. Your first mission is to bring morphine to Capital Knot City. While taking shelter in a cave, you meet Fragile, a young woman who lives in an aged body after having been caught in the time fall. Got soaked from neck to toe. I can't help you with that. Upon arriving at your destination, it turns out the morphine is for Bridget, the president of the United Cities of America, or UCA for short, who is lying on her deathbed. Madam President, We've brought Sam. We learn that Bridget is also the woman who raised Sam, and that he cut ties with her and all other connections after a tragic event ten years earlier. Bridget urges Sam to join the effort to reunite America, and passes shortly after. In order to prevent another void out, you then take her body up to the incinerator and cremate it. On returning, we get a more detailed briefing about what it is that the UCA expects us to do. Bridget may no longer be with us, but her legacy has a chance to live on. Here we meet Sam's sister, Amelie. Or rather, we meet a projection of her, as she has been taken prisoner on the other side of the country by a terrorist organization that resists the UCA's message of unification. It's all to safeguard the continued independence of Edgenot City. The leader of this organization, who calls himself Higgs, 
was also an old colleague of Fragile, who subsequently became somewhat of an outcast after Higgs radicalized. You did business with terrorists? Whoever pays, huh? He wasn't like that back then. Apparently, the best chance at rescuing Amelie is by heading west and reuniting the divided cities. Sam, we want you to go west and finish what Amelie started. Please, Sam. We need you. Only then, when the chiral network is strong enough, do you have a chance to face Higgs. And so, having a personal stake in the UCA's effort, this is exactly what Sam does. Now let's talk about the actual gameplay. As is probably clear by now, the gameplay is built around making deliveries. At the beginning of each order, you load the cargo onto your back, as well as additional tools you may need during your journey. Think about ladders to climb walls or cross rivers, climbing anchors to scale down cliffs, and perhaps an extra pair of boots in case yours wear out. Besides these challenges posed by the environment itself, there are other obstacles you'll encounter, like timefall zones with BTs, and cargo thieves called mules who suffer from a condition called border syndrome that makes them obsessed with making deliveries, and will attack you if you're transporting anything through their territory. I will go into more detail about these specific threats and their place in the story later, but for now I want to stay focused on the general impression I got from making my first deliveries in the game. Because, as I'm sure many other players felt as well, these first few hours of traversing the harsh environments with limited tools at your disposal, and while constantly having to maintain your balance with heavy loads on your back, makes for a rather tedious experience. It certainly confronts you with the things we take for granted in other open world games, where you can carry along huge inventories without it affecting your mobility and where movement is often as simple as pointing yourself in the right direction and pressing forward. It is no surprise then that these elements are generally viewed as the lesser engaging aspects of open world games, as the necessary evil between more exciting forms of gameplay, which might be the reason why so many games try to make traveling more interesting by for example using it as an opportunity for storytelling, or by implementing more exciting ways to move around. Kojima, however, clearly wanted to go in a different direction. あの、ま、ゲームができてからま、何十年とこう移動っていうのがほとんどその、そこはリアルじゃなくて、ゲーム的にま、デフォルメされてるってね。だいたいプレイヤーはヒーローで空を飛んだり、ものすごく速いスピ
take too little and you will be punished by not having the necessary tools to overcome specific obstacles. At all times you have to actively consider the terrain ahead and map out the best possible way to traverse it. And yet, there are also moments where everything quiets down, where things are going your way and you are just taking in the environment. Moments like these are often accompanied by relaxing music, which further stimulates you to take a breath, to turn inward and reflect on the journey so far. This is when it dawned on me that, in this game about making connections, the first connection you make is to the Earth. By having the main focus be on traversing the environment, the world of Death Stranding is given a real sense of place, a real sense of texture. Even when you're flying past everything on the highway or on your zipline later in the game, you still feel connected to the ground underneath to the terrain that you once struggled to traverse. It lays the foundation for the connections you make later on, for in that stranding, you are not playing alone. I'm Sam! If you are logged into Death Stranding's network, which the game automatically does provided you are connected to the internet, You'll quickly notice there are things in the world that you didn't put there yourself. Be it a watchtower, a climbing anchor, or even a whole bridge. They were put there by other players. You won't actually encounter any of them, but they leave a mark on your world nonetheless. Just as you do on theirs. This is the Strand System. At first, the strand system appears like a small gimmick that gives you the occasional helping hand. Need to cross a river but forgot to bring a ladder? Here's one that was placed there by another player. Need to fabricate a specific tool but don't have the resources for it? Check the shared locker and you probably find what you were looking for. But as the game progresses, it slowly but steadily changes the way you approach your deliveries. Most importantly, it adds a moral component to the previously established connection to the world of Death Stranding. For now you know that the challenge of traversing its harsh environments is not just your burden, it's everyone's. 次にじゃあ同じような橋を立てようとした時にこれも自分のためではあるんですけどえ心のどこかでやっぱり自分が立てた橋を使ってくれるっていうのは分かってるのでちょっと自分以外の人のことを考えるんですよねでそこに思いや
Thanks for the help. そういう、えー、ちょっと、えー、行き過ぎてる今のオンラインの中傷とか暴力を、えー、一歩、えー、一歩というか間接的に意図的につなぎ直すことでその辺のちょっと今失われてるであろうその思いやりみたいなものを体感してもらう When you perceive others as essentially friendly and cooperative, it fills you with a subtle yet meaningful sense of hope. It makes you want to be more caring as well. In my experience, it has even led to an indirect code of ethics where, for example, I wouldn't leave vehicles in the middle of the road because they might obstruct other players. Or, in another example, I once considered dismantling a zip line I no longer had use for. But then realized I might be disrupting the game of someone else who may have used my zipline to build their own network, just as my own network utilized the ziplines of others. The strand system changes the game significantly, but besides affecting the gameplay, it also has its place in the story. And for that, let's continue our journey further into the West. Once you have connected the settlements in the eastern region, you head to Port Nod City to travel towards the central region. But before you do, you encounter Higgs, who claims to understand the truth of the Dead Stranding. Oh, there's so much you people don't know. He accuses Amelie and her dream of a united America of being the real destructive force, an extinction entity. As we will see further on, Higgs is also used to make meta commentary about the game, and gaming in general. In this case, the message that seems directly aimed at us, the players, is his assertion that after having gone through the great effort of connecting the Eastern region, what we really desire is to be relieved from the struggle. Or, in gaming terms, what we want is a game over. Isn't this what you've been waiting for this whole time? But alas, the struggle continues. Higgs summons a BT and a brief boss fight ensues. After defeating the creature, you finally board a ship and travel to the central region, the biggest area of the game. It is here that you will spend most of your time, and it is also where the game really begins to transform. Whereas in the eastern region you felt like a lonesome adventurer working hard to make deliveries in a harsh wilderness with only the occasional helping hand of other players. In the central region, all of this appears to change. The world almost begins to feel crowded. The gameplay too is affected by this. Instead of battling the elements, you now have easy access to vehicles and can build highways that make deliveries much, much easier. Always a pleasure, Sam. There's a variety of new weapons that turn BTs and mules from a dreaded obstacle into a relatively minor inconvenience. And once you get access to zip lines, you barely have to touch the ground at all. However, it's not exactly as simple as that, because just as you start getting used to moving around on your reverse strike, You'll quickly find the environment responds in kind by getting a lot rougher as you're moving deeper into the central region. And by the time you reach the mountains, the vehicles you once thought were going to change the game no longer seem all that useful. The same goes for zip lines. While these are especially useful in the mountains, you have to be connected to the chiral network to build them, which means that you first have to traverse these mountains on foot. It's only when you reach the isolated settlements and convince them to join the UCA that you can start building your network and establish easier modes of travel. This process of getting new tools to once again have to be dependent on the bare essentials when you enter unconnected territories can feel a little frustrating. Especially when you're used to games that progress in a linear fashion, where once you're given something new, you never have to look back again at the old. But again, I think this was a deliberate choice on Kojima's part, because by never really letting you off the hook, there's always a return to that first connection, the connection you made by traveling through the world on foot. 
It keeps you engaged with the gameplay's core element of having to consciously consider and adapt to each new situation. Sometimes this means taking a step forward, sometimes it means taking a step back. More essentially, it means finding creative solutions with the tools you are given. For while making deliveries can be a challenge sometimes, the game also offers plenty of opportunities to ease the struggle. For example, by checking the weather forecast, you can avoid timefall or use it to your advantage to safely travel through new areas while they take shelter from the rain. And for those willing to think further outside the box, there are clever ways to use the tools at your disposal. Take for example how the sticky gun can be used to retrieve cargo from hazardous areas that you would otherwise need an oxygen mask for or how floating carriers can help you to safely cross deep waters, or easily slide down mountains. I don't think we could have survived without outside assistance. The chiral network could make a huge difference. It could help us finally get back on our feet. You've given us a gift more precious than you know. When it comes to serving the story, I think that above all, these new tools and structures are meant to convey one simple message that life is a lot easier when you're connected to others. The game indeed becomes less challenging once you've connected areas to the chiral network. But this is exactly the point. When you enter unconnected territory, you're pretty much on your own. It's only when you have reconnected a settlement or city to the chiral network that the structures of other players become visible and that you can fabricate new equipment. The sense of ease that follows is therefore a reward for that effort. It is the light that you reignited from the darkness. One that is meant to be enjoyed before you once again head into the unknown. It also reveals a lot about Kojima's world building, which is another subject that I believe tends to be misunderstood when it comes to Death Stranding. As many others have pointed out, the game is a post-apocalyptic survival story. But if you approach it as such, the gameplay doesn't quite match the expectations that are typically associated with that genre. Like most other survival games, the world of Dead Stranding is in ruins and filled with dangers. But unlike most survival games, there isn't really a descent into primal behavior. Humanity hasn't regressed itself to scavenging, robbing or cannibalizing for basic survival. In fact, the world of Death Stranding is a world of plenty. All the necessary elements for a civilized society are already here. There's no shortage of resources, there's infrastructure, and most cities, while isolated, live in relative safety. Which is also why so many of your orders don't involve essential items, but also include delivering movies, books, and sparkling wine. Some settlements are even doing quite well under the new conditions. Just look at how the Timefall farm uses the accelerated passing of time to quickly produce large quantities of beer. The only thing that's missing, you can probably guess it, is connections. As said before, the chiral network signifies more than just an internet connection. It is about something deeper than that, about being part of a whole about a feeling of togetherness that can't quite be put into words, but about which you can immediately tell when it's absent. In that sense, it feels much closer to our modern world where we have more possibilities for connection than ever before. And yet so many people still feel profoundly alone. The mules even seem to be a direct product of a society that is so interconnected that it lost sight of what a connection really means blindly hunting down cargo and hauling empty boxes in a pointless charade that mimics the effort of real porters, but doesn't actually deliver anything. They are like social media users who obsess over followers, likes and presentation, but have forgotten what it really means to establish relations. The BTs too feed into this theme as you gradually realize they are not actually out to harm you, they merely want to be connected again even if it is through something as simple as the touch of a hand. It is as if Kojima wants us to relearn how to establish real connections, and this is what the world of Dead Stranding reflects. It is a world where intimacy is the rarest and most valuable resource. Making your way through the central region and meeting all its settlers, 
you'll find this commodity playing some role in their lives. They aren't exactly fleshed out, but they all present little stories about connections. Connections between parents and children, brothers and sisters, between lovers, artists, and, as shown by the many celebrity cameos in the game, between friends. However, Kojima also shows us that while a lot of things become easier as we become more connected, this doesn't mean that all things are easier. The connections we make are fragile, they make us vulnerable, and most importantly, they can be broken. After being swept up in a mysterious storm, Sam awakens on a battlefield. It is later explained that it was actually another beach, but not one that belongs to an individual. It was brought into existence by the collective suffering of soldiers that fought and died in the First World War. Here you encounter a strange soldier who seems both at home as well as out of place in these trenches. This is Clifford Unger. You've seen him before. It is the same man that occasionally appears when you plug in your BB and some of its memories become entangled with yours. Cliff is the father of your BB and the combat veteran who appears to have died in some tragic event. Desperate and restless, he hunts Sam over a multitude of battlefields throughout the game, trying to get back his BB. He is a personification of unresolved grief, manifesting itself in an environment that embodies pure death. For of course, in a story about the value of connections, death is the ultimate antagonist, the definitive way to break a connection. This is also reflected in the gameplay. During these war zone battles, the game most resembles a typical shooter game, but the experience is specifically framed as tragic, and pointless. In fact, back in the real world, taking a life is an act of extreme consequence. You are given lethal weapons, but if you actually use one towards that purpose, you have to make sure you take the body up to an incinerator before the timer ends and you trigger a void out. The interesting thing is that while it doesn't really change the gameplay mechanics as you can still shoot and disable enemies with non-lethal force, it does reframe it. It makes you reflect on the violence that is so often committed in other games. Something similar can be found in the way you fight BTs, as the weapons you get to battle them also drain your own blood. Again, it's a simple subversion of a familiar gameplay mechanic. But it does add the suggestion that every time you break a connection, you also sacrifice a little part of yourself. A point that is emphasized once you get a special knife that can instantly send BTs to the afterlife. The weapon is given to you by Mama, but before you can use it, she tells you the story about how her lost baby remained connected to her when its tiny soul stranded in our world. She's my daughter. I'm her mama. And then asks you to cut the umbilical cord to sever their connection in the hope that her baby may finally rest in peace. Besides being an emotional scene, it is also an exemplification of how all BTs were at one point people's loved ones. Sam himself also has a special relation to death, for he is a repatriate, someone who is able to resurrect himself from the dead. In the context of the gameplay, it's a convenient way of coming back to life without having to resort to the traditional game over screen when you die but it also invokes a somewhat uneasy feeling as it keeps you in the struggle. It never gives you that relief that Higgs believed we so much desire. Not even for that brief moment of pause you usually get before you load your most recent save. 
Within the story, it is a curse as much as it is a blessing. For although Sam can bring himself back from the dead, he cannot bring back others. He cannot bring back his family. Lost my family in an accident. Ten years ago, Sam's pregnant wife killed herself, subsequently causing a void out that wiped out the entire town. Being the only repatriate, Sam made his way back to the land of the living to find himself all alone. It adds another layer of depth to the previously discussed theme of connection and shows us that the obstacles preventing closeness aren't actually made up of mountains, rivers and ravines. They are made up of sorrow, anger and regret. The world of Dead Stranding isn't just a world without connection, it is a world in grief. A world filled with individuals who are haunted by the past, who are suffering in pain, who are mourning the lives that have been and the lives that could have been. It reveals the active forces that prevent us from being close to each other and raises a serious problem. For if we are inevitably going to suffer, why bother at all? I've put together the bones of a theory. It's patchy, but worth sharing, I think. Somewhere along the way, it is revealed that the Death Stranding happened five times before and caused the mass extinction events of the past. We also learn that they come into being through an extinction entity, a living being that is naturally selected to become the bridge between the world of the living and the dead, thereby causing a Death Stranding. It is theorized that these extinction entities are a natural part of the universe, the living equivalents of entropy that pushes everything from order to disorder. These are connected to the beach via their strands, and it is through this connection that they somehow bring about a death stranding. Metaphorically speaking, it is a way to personify annihilation, the abstract yet inescapable knowledge that one day all of us and everything we've worked for will be gone. More specifically, this ultimate death is personified by Amelie. I've kept things from you, worn a mask for the longest time. Everything Higgs said about me is true. As an extinction entity, Amelie is bound to a beach from where she, if she wanted to, could merge all other beaches with hers and bring about the last stranding, the end of all life. It is this power that Higgs is after. We've had five mass extinctions, each caused by an extinction entity. And now it's time for number six. He reveals that Sam unwittingly aided him by connecting everyone to the chiral network. Because remembering that Chiralium is native to the beach, Amelie can use it to easily connect her beach to everyone else's. This may seem like a somewhat uninspired twist, but I think it fits into the larger theme as it is also a reminder that being connected to others makes you more vulnerable. It gives you something to lose. However, Sam's not going to give up without a fight. So when Higgs escapes to Amelie's beach, you're going after him. Here it is. On the beach, you face Higgs one last time, as he puts it. So, no BTs, no void outs, no bullshit. Just a good old fashioned boss fight. One more in for the end. One last game over. And a good old fashioned boss fight it is. As per usual, these battles often have a couple of different stages where you slowly chip away at your opponent's health as the dramatic tension rises. I can beat you. I can beat you! Most of the time, you end up swinging fists at each other until you are victorious, and then sit back as you watch the final cutscene and ultimately the credits. This, however, is not what happens in Dead Stranding. 
While the climactic fight does reach that stage where both characters are in close proximity and the gameplay is reduced to pressing one single button over and over again. Here it doesn't feel empowering, it doesn't feel heroic, it just feels cruel. And more importantly, it ends nothing. Well, congratulations. You won the game. Too bad you didn't stop shit. After defeating Higgs, you free Amelie and there's a strange scene where the two of you run along the beach as if we're in some dreamlike happy ending where you have rescued the damsel in distress and everything is well. But of course, it isn't. A little further down the shore, you encounter Bridget and Die Hardman, who are in some kind of confrontation. Suddenly, Cliff, the combat veteran, emerges out of the ocean. No. It can't be. He recognizes Die Hardman. Is that really you? But then returns to his original goal. Give me back my BB. Amelie throws us into the ocean, and we're left trying to make sense of this whole new web of complications. This ending before the end then, I think, mostly serves as a comment on video games, on the things we've come to expect from them, and on what they actually communicate through these so often unquestioned gameplay elements. Because when you look at a game like Death Stranding, and think about everything we've gone through so far, all the themes that we've discussed. What would it mean if it all ended with beating someone to a pulp? So, if this wasn't the real ending, then what is? Where is she? We don't know. From this point on, the plot twists and turns a couple more times as you're trying to get to the truth of what's going on. But to make a long story short, it turns out Amelie is the one who is behind the Death Stranding. She was the one who was controlling Higgs by giving him his powers, who staged her own abduction to give Sam the encouragement he needed to connect everyone to the chiral network, and who wants to bring about the Last Stranding, the end of all existence. She was their leader. The terrorist voidouts, the whole extinction agenda, Amelie was behind it all. By having to confront Amelie, all the subjects and themes we've examined so far are stripped down to their essence, to one fundamental problem. How to cope with the knowledge of our impending doom. How to find meaning in life knowing we will eventually go extinct. Why build anything knowing it will inevitably be destroyed? It is perhaps the most important of the existential questions, and basically turns Death Stranding into the myth of Sisyphus, the man who was doomed by the gods to push a rock up a mountain, only to see it roll back down again, an act that was to be repeated for all eternity. As the existential philosopher Albert Camus explains, the story of Sisyphus is only a tragic one if he is conscious about his fate, if he, like us, can conceive of his own mortality and the transitory nature of all things. Otherwise he wouldn't see past the present moment and be filled with hope each time he went up the mountain. In the light of this great philosophical dilemma, we can also better understand the purpose of Higgs. Like Sam, Higgs too was a porter once, that is, until he met Amelie and was confronted with the same existential question that Sam is about to face. For Higgs, the knowledge of certain extinction rendered life meaningless, and he became the embodiment of cynical nihilism. What happened to you? This is perhaps best demonstrated in the flashback in which Fragile recounts her fallout with Higgs. She explains how she wanted to prevent him from detonating a nuclear bomb in the city, and how he gave her the chance to do so by stripping her down and making her run through the timefall. Trade a lot of your time for a little bit of the cities? <laughs> Hell, seems like a fair exchange to me. 
a cruel act to showcase that good deeds and heroism are pointless, and will only be punished in a meaningless universe. You did the right thing. I'm no hero, Sam. That choice I made, I've regretted it ever since. But actually it is Higgs who is the grandiose one, boasting ultimate meaninglessness as some kind of grand truth, seeing himself as a messiah, and naming himself after the god Particle. After defeating him, you get a chance to access his journals in which it becomes clear that all this posturing was just a mask hiding his real insecurities. You thought you had the power, he writes, that you were the one fated to lead them unto extinction. Yet here you are, alone. God Particle? <laughs> a stupid name for a stupid goddamn fool. This was your life, Higgs. Your tale, told by an idiot. Full of sound and righteous fury. Signifying nothing. It also shows why Higgs couldn't be the final villain. For defeating someone like him would only have been a victory over one man's grandiosity and it wouldn't have solved the greater existential problem created by Amelie. No way in hell am I hauling myself all the way back there. Before you can face her, however, the game makes you walk all the way back to the very beginning in the eastern region. One more climb up the mountain. One more chance to think about the meaning of it all. Thank heavens you made it. When you make it back to Capital Not City, you used the dreamcatcher Amelie gave you as a child, another symbol of your connection. They are no mere trinkets. They are singular, irreplaceable totems, embodiments of your shared memories. Two sides of a coin, the price of entry to her beach. There. Here you finally come face to face with Amelie, who tells you her side of the story. She reveals that she and Bridget are the same person, and that her soul and body became separated after Bridget fell ill in her 20s, leaving her soul stranded on the beach to become the extinction entity, while her body remained in our world as Bridget. She realizes she may have been wrong about wanting to end all life, but explains how she got so lonely, so tired of waiting, so disheartened by witnessing life suffer, that she believed no one would blame her if she ended it all with some dignity. Ultimately, she leaves it up to Sam, who is given two options. One, he can take the path of Higgs and let Amelie bring about the last stranding. Or, he can kill her, and ensure humanity lives to die another day. I don't know what to do. Sure you do. After everything, how could you not? It's almost time to go, Sam. There's only one way to end that stranding, and it involves neither of the two options that you were presented with. There's no killing, no mass extinction. Instead, you put down your gun, walk up to Amelie, and embrace her. I'm here for you. Always. Like you were for me. Having been reminded of her connection to Sam, and to human life in general, Amelie closes her beach, and thus herself, off from everyone else. Which brings an end to the Death Stranding, but also dooms her to spend eternity alone, thereby essentially giving herself a death sentence. Living is no different from being dead if you're all alone. It's an almost Christ-like sacrifice, a commitment to the ultimate suffering for the sake of others. Sam too initially strands in purgatory, and you get to experience a taste of what Amelie's fate will be like by spending the next 40 minutes or so aimlessly wandering the beach as you watch the credits roll, 
and listen to some additional exposition. Don't give up. You're still connected. Gotcha. After what feels like forever, you are rescued by your friends, who spent months looking for you and finally found you thanks to another totem of your connection. Not a weapon, but a lifeline. Today we come together to celebrate the birth of a new nation. A new nation for a new world. The United Cities of America. Back home, Sam has some trouble readjusting and points out that even though the last stranding has been averted, the world has not been magically healed. The world's still broken. The same as before. Indeed, while extinction has been put on hold, the deeper existential question still remains. People still need to find meaning in a world that seems to be moving towards annihilation. But this, I believe, is the real beauty of Death Stranding. Because if you've played the game, and you made it to this point, that question has already been answered. For while Sam's embrace was not exactly a grand existential statement in itself, it was meaningful as an accumulation of everything that came before, as a symbol of the unwavering human spirit that struggles on and dares to love despite knowing it may all lead to nothing. You know this because it is what you've been practicing all along, going through tremendous efforts for small acts of kindness, caring about other players, and lending them the helping hand that gives them a fighting chance in an otherwise desperate situation. It's such a simple yet incredibly life-affirming gameplay element that doesn't just tell you, but actually lets you experience the reward found in sacrificing for others in the struggle to make each other's lives a little easier. I carried my mother's message to people all across the country. But not everyone was willing to accept it. It also explains why Sam was needed for this mission to connect the people of America in the first place. When Amelie first tried to connect them, they were too cynical to believe her promises of unification. They think that America can only be rebuilt by force, by men who tell them what to do. But all these people did end up trusting Sam, and it is exactly because he didn't promise them the value of connection. He exemplified it through his actions. Actually, your actions, your unrelenting spirit and devotion to deliver the people's packages, to care for their needs, your victory then was not based on a spectacular act of heroism, but on your continued attention and patience and discipline. It perfectly captures how the great existential question about the meaning of life does not have an equally great and definitive answer. Like Sisyphus continuously climbing the same mountain, your work to deliver packages is also pretty much the same throughout the game but the experience of it varies greatly. Sometimes things are going well and you experience real beauty and enjoyment. Sometimes things are hard and you simply may not be feeling up to it. Sometimes it all feels pointless, and other times it feels profoundly rewarding. With all these endless ways of experiencing life, there's gotta be at least one that makes it meaningful, that makes it all worth it. As Albert Camus concluded, we must imagine Sisyphus happy. You still with me, though? Before we end this, there's one final piece to the puzzle. While Sam was stranded outside of our world, his BB appears to have died. Poor thing was never truly alive. Not in this world, at least. The last mission, then, is to once again go up to the incinerator and cremate its tiny body. Before you do, you plug in one last time and Cliff's full story is finally revealed. Brought you an astronaut. Mankind can go anywhere. Even out of space. 
We see how he was a part of the early BB experiments and how he got attached to the one in his care. BB, can you hear me? In a desperate attempt to rescue it, he is ultimately shot and killed. For some unknown reason, he then awakens on the battlefield, not remembering anything about himself. He operates purely on instinct, and the deep grief that keeps him linked to his BB. Towards the end of the game, he slowly begins to remember who he was, and when the past and present merge into a moment of connection that seems to transcend time and space, he realizes what really drove him towards Sam. You are Sam Bridges. My son. My bridge to the future. The memories you've been seeing weren't the ones of your BB. They were yours. It is also revealed that when Cliff got shot, you got hit too. Oh God. That BB too. And washed up on Amelie's beach, who, out of compassion towards Cliff and his effort to save you, turned you into a repatriate and granted you your life. Because BBs were initially treated as disposable tools that were never meant to be brought into the world in the first place, this final sequence shows that your existence and everything you've accomplished was the direct result of an act of love, of a connection that defies ultimate meaninglessness, that is stronger than death. It's a circle that is completed as Amelie, just before she ends the Death Stranding, brings your BB back to life too. Lastly, because it is unclear how Cliff came back after being killed, what exactly his powers are, and where he got them from, there's a theory that Cliff, like Amelie, is also a special kind of being. One thing's for sure, he is nothing like a BT. At the very least, he seems to be a repatriate like Sam. Although again, we don't know who gave him that ability. Whatever he is, I believe he is a beautiful example of what can be seen as a balancing force to an extinction entity. A survival entity, if you will. One that only grows stronger by being connected to life. Be a father didn't make me scared. It made me brave. He personifies a yearning so deep and instinctive, so shared between all of us that maybe we don't even need to justify our reasons to keep on keeping on. Maybe we don't have to apologize for existing as if destruction is the only legitimate force in the universe, as if creation isn't just as real and observable around us. So far, every mass extinction that should have been the end of it all, instead became the beginning of something new, a new vessel of life that, while facing impossible odds, resisted annihilation and endured. Who is to say which force will win in the end? For all we know, the death of our universe might be the birth of another. Either way, it's not up to us to decide over these cosmic matters. All we have is today. One brief moment. One fighting chance that we were given by those who came before us. Those who suffered for us, who sacrificed for us, and who, through love and connection, built a bridge to the future and placed tomorrow in our hands. Like all of Hideo Kojima's games, Death Stranding 2 was heavily inspired by cinema. In an interview with Time magazine, he said, Through movies, I learned about so many different political themes I hadn't been interested in, and cultural things I hadn't been aware of and economic factors I hadn't thought about. It is the reason Kojima tries to watch a film every day. And with MUBI, you can too. MUBI is an online cinema streaming a hand-picked selection of films from around the globe. Every day they present a new film, whether it's a timeless classic, a thought-provoking documentary, or an acclaimed masterpiece. There's always a carefully curated selection of 30 films to dive into. It's a simple but highly effective way to start exploring the riches of cinema, 
and I'm happy to share this with you by offering 30 days for free. So head on over to movie.com slash like stories of old to begin your extended free trial today.